Booga, hello. Okay. So, just to double check, I'm, I'm going to give it just another moment. Uh, are there any OpenSSH developers in the room? Um, no, no, because Colin, we pretty much ignore you.
Okay. Maybe you don't have LDAP. Everybody's network is a little different. The important thing here is that authorized keys command is a script. Do you have a, a database on the network, any kind of directory, any, anything? You, know, you are a sysadmin. Scripts are your thing. If your company has a standard where you are using, you, know, you provide all your data via WordPress, XML, RPC, over HTTP, via an SSH tunnel, that's fine. Um, an Excel spreadsheet on a sysvol, whatever. Just write a script to access it. Host keys. Host keys are the thing. known hosts to all of the client machines or you can have the client look up known hosts.
those users, I'm just going to pick a, a hypothetical name here, you know, say, you know, user Darcy comes to you and says, you blew away my known host file, and I painstakingly hand verified all Say, no, I, I didn't blow away your work, it's just moved. Um, and the, once you're at the point where you're distributing this, you can also set global client SSH settings in SSH underscore config. So if your organization does something like run SSHD on an off port, or you have special requirements, or you, you need this little flag twiddled on all of the clients everywhere, you set it globally and it works for everyone. So, when it comes to clients, the most common one other than SSH, sorry, other than open SSH is SSH, is PuTTY. PuTTY, of course, stores its host keys in the registry because it's Windows and you put everything in the registry. Why wouldn't you? PuTTY ships with a Python script to convert known hosts into registry keys. Run the script, you have a reg file, give it to your AD admin, and eventually they'll put it in user login scripts and distribute it. Now, if your AD admin is slow, you can always do things like, you know, email the registry file to all your users and teach them to blindly double-click on emailed registry files before using SSH. Um, I, I'm going to recommend subject lines like, this one weird trick makes your putty work. Um, putty admins hate when you click on this. Or you know, if, if you do this once, you may find your AD administrator becomes much more responsive. So, if you don't want to distribute, you can have the SSH client check on the network through SSH FP DNS records. Now, uh, people tell you this requires DNS sec. Um, well, I hear folks arguing against that. Um, if you want to shuffle security critical data around in unencrypted UDP across the network, um, that, that's just begging to be spoofed, well, okay, it's not my network. So, uh, what, you generate an SSHFP record with SSH keygen minus R in the host name, and it spits out a bunch of SSHFP records. Put those in your zone file. If you are uh, using key files from a different host, add the minus F flag. So, that's fairly straightforward. For, tr for traditional SSH use, or you look them up from the network, client and server alike. SSH certificates are something very, very different. And specifically, they're different from the TLS X509 certs that you all know and loathe from web servers and other applications. So, what's a certificate authority? It's really just a method of delegating trust. It says, I trust this thing. I trust VeriSign. I trust Let's Encrypt. I trust Wem's house of cheap certs, what, whatever. So, and it takes two features, two technological features, encryption and signing. And these features are, are both in regular SSH keys. 
So an SSH certificate authority is just an SSH key that you decide you're going to use as a certificate authority. Uh, it really is exactly like a self-signed TLS certificate because you don't want anyone outside your organization to trust this. There is no reason why hosts and clients on my network should trust certificates issued by oh, Kurt's network. Kurt has his own network and I, I really by design I should not trust it. Um, and it's not Kurt's fault, it's just we don't need external trust. Uh, certificate authorities, if your network is large enough to require them, then you really do need automation. You have to be able to copy files and restart SSHD reliably. Look at Ansible if you haven't. So one thing you see in a certificate is an expiration date. Uh, it's real tempting when you do a self-signed certificate to give it a 25-year but they will be insecure still contained the first ever uh, SSH version 1 user authentication public key I had ever created. And I really only noticed it when the FreeBSD cluster disabled SSH v1 and suddenly I couldn't get into Freefall and uh, oops. But, yes. Uh, so have these, remember you're going to need automation, have these expire roughly every year, a add bonus time in case someone gets appendicitis, and ideally you will renew these in half the expiration time, because, yeah, yes. Oh, wow, well, we're close to doomsday. Yes, so I, for, for those at home, year 2038 is within 25 years. So time counters might roll over, and yeah, don't do that. So expiration is key, uh, or expiration is why we need automation. Uh, worst case, I want to be sure that all the certificates in my company expire two days after I retire. So, organizing a certificate authority. Have one for users and one for hosts. You could use the same. I mean, it's theoretically possible, but organizations change, and one day the group responsible for users won't have access to setting up servers and vice versa, and no, separate ones. Also, don't put your certificate authority in Etsy SSH. Uh, that just confuses the host's native SSH service from the certificate authority. Uh, here I've created, you know, user local SSH CA users and hosts as directories for each CA. Give each host in there uh, their own host or user their own subdirectory in that. If nothing else, you're going to be seeing a lot of files labeled authorized keys from a lot of users. You're going to have a lot of files labeled, you know, SSH host EC DSA 25519 underscore key dot pub. And you could rename these as part of your process to add the host name or the username. And we all know that at some point this will go horribly wrong. And 
it's much better to just separate them by directory and, and don't go trying to change every single file name that you process. I would hope it's automatic. Yeah, so why not, I mean, because you're putting it in their name, why not just make that name the file? It, why make it a directory? I, I, I would put each, I would... Uh, so you got user slash... User slash authorized Darcy keys. Slash and then whatever file name is it, why not just put my file into Darcy itself? Yeah, yeah I mean, that's what I do. No, I mean, You know, you, Darcy, you're probably quite capable of doing that cleanly. I've seen too many things that seem to be obvious go horribly wrong to recommend it. Uh, Maybe may my life in, in enterprise IT where some, somebody hits the wrong button. Uh, I, I separate things as blatantly as possible. That's, and then again, Every sysadmin has their biases. Pretending against DKAC errors. Yeah. So let's talk about generating keys. There is uh, the SSH key gen command. Uh, this should look awfully familiar. And you, you define the type of key. Why am I pointing the laser at my laptop and not the screen? <laughs> ah, yep, yep, Darcy has me messed up. Okay. Yeah, oh, oh yeah. Uh, use the minus F flag to give it a uh, file name. And minus C lets you put a comment in. And be very clear in your comment on that this is a, a CA key and what type, and put a date in. So if you have a certificate authority, you have to teach. I'm sorry, I should go back. This gives you a private and a public key. Protect your private key keys. If you lose your certificate authority private key, then whoever has it can generate certificates and this violates your whole org. And wow, I, I said I wouldn't be offended or hurt if Peter Wem, uh, le, sorry, if anyone left the room. But if you drive Peter Wem out, well, <laughs> uh, I, I'm good. Uh-huh. Yep. So, SSHG authenticates users. It must trust the user certificate authority. So, create a file that contains all of the trusted user certificate authority public keys, one key per line, and in SSHG config, use this trusted user CA key. And that's really it. For the SSH client, it needs to trust the host certificate authority. And uh, the SSH known hosts file is for exactly trusted keys. So rather than have a separate option for certificate authorities, you modify the uh, the public key with this at cert authority marker and the domains that it is good for and then have your key. So certificates also have a concept of an identity and this identity will be will show up at various points when you use it. What the certificate is for you set the identity when you create the cert and it cannot change. You have to regenerate a new cert to give it a different identity. Um, and the identity gets logged whenever that uh, certificate is used. 
Uh, I begin identities for hosts with host underscore and users with user underscore because uh, being egotistical, I have accounts named MWL and machines named MWL. So, uh, I'm also going to recommend that you keep your certificates. If you generate a cert, keep it for at least a cycle or so after it should be out of production. It's easier to revoke when you have a copy. Uh, and, and again, you cannot trust users. So, how do you actually create a certificate? Well, OpenSSH has this beautiful SSH key sign command that is completely irrelevant to signing keys. You want to use SSH keygen. And what you've got, uh, minus S is your certificate authority, minus I is the identity, I'm creating a key for the host sloth, minus H means this is a host cert, minus N is the host that this is good for, minus V is the expiration date in relative date format, and then there's your, the name of your key file. Here I'm signing all of the dot pub, here I'm creating certificates from all of the public keys for this host. And in this example I did not trim down the supported algorithms, but you create all of these dash cert files that correspond with the dot pub files. The uh, host certificate option to give the certificate that goes with the key. I'm going to recommend that you put each cert next to the key that it's paired with. Again, because humans are easily confused. You can also look at the certificate contents on the command line with the minus capital L option. And it'll tell you things, you know, what what cert signed it, what is this key for, when does it expire, uh, what host is it good for, etc. Usual things you would expect to find in a TLS cert without all of the extra stuff that gets stuck in a TLS cert. So, if you want to test a host cert, Move the client's known hosts out of the way and try to log in. You should connect and be logged in without being prompted to verify the host key. If that doesn't work, uh, add minus Vs until you get an explanation and, and go search for what that error code means. My usual error turns out to be that I don't install the certificate authority on the client uh, for whatever reason. You, of course, will invent your own most common error. So, user certificates. Again, SSH key gen, not SSH key sign. And the real difference here, there's no minus H flag. That's it. For the user to use their certificate, copy the certificate file into home SSH right next to the corresponding public key file. And at that point, uh, go into the server, and you know perfectly well if, if the authorized key file exists and has that matching key, they'll be logged in. And you can't trust users to not add extra stuff, so you want to disable authorized keys. In SSHD, if you set authorized keys file to none, the only way a user can log in is with that certificate. And again, if for some reason your first attempt doesn't work, 
add minus v's until an error pops up. So, does that make sense so far? I'm going to take silence as consent. So, last bit here. Does anyone here work for, say, Google, Facebook, Amazon, giant companies with millions of servers? Oh, you do. Uh, do you know how they deploy and run SSH internally? Uh, you, you do. Excellent. You know better than I do. Would you like to finish the talk? <laughs> well, uh, feel free to jump in then and, and illuminate things or considerations that I have screwed up. So, there are organizations that need more than 65,000 UIDs. Uh, there are organizations that have so much information that they really don't want to put, they don't want to have everyone poking at LDAP because they're going to need tens of thousands of LDAP servers and this is just terrible. So, this is where uh, principles come in. Principle is a named entity that is not tied to a host name or a UID. And it can be structured any way you want. And a principle can be authorized to log in via SSH. So you can have, say, I have the principle of Kurt M. And, he can, and you can tell the server that principal Kurt M may log in as root. So that's where the authorized principles file comes in. Here I've got a sample one. Uh, a few principles that exist. Uh, the principal everywhere root. If this is tied to, if the server is presented with a certificate that has this everywhere root principle on the cert, they can log in. If they have the Europe root or Europe database principles. So when you create the user certificate, you would assign principles to that certificate. And so this server is clearly in Europe. It's a database server, and folks on that team can log into it. You can also do this authorized principles file, Etsy SSH principles percent u, and say someone presents a cert and they want to log in as root. SSHD will check Etsy SSH principles root, and check that file for who can log in as that. So you might have you know, uh, a root file, a db admin file, uh, a web admin file, for just having just a few accounts on the host. There. Can, can, can we have multiple? Like, can someone be in more, more than one principle? Yes, and just like in this slide. Oh. <laughs> Yes, people can be in multiple groups. Or people can, certificates can have multiple principles. So here I've, I'm creating a cert. And since this is a huge organization that I'm condemned to work for, it's got uh, the identity starts with user, it has my employee ID number, it has my name. Minus N gives the principle, which I'm in peasants and vermin. And this one is good for 52 weeks. So if someone needs me to be an additional principles, I need a new certificate. So 
So, principles file. Copy your authorized principles file across your millions of servers with automation. Uh, no. No. There is a script to look up principles for a user when someone tries to log in as that user. So, and again, use a, an individual unprivileged user to run that command. So, this is how you would safely log in as root on your machines because it has to be an assert, it has to have the principle that says you can log in as root, and that cert is uniquely tied to a person. So, and that person had to have used a passphrase to unlock their private key to use the cert. So if you have your millions of hosts and the hundreds of thousands of sysadmins and you need to divide up roles, well, you know, your database admin logs in as DB admin, but the system records the, everything you need to blame them, which is really what's important. So, uh, hey, 45 minutes, perfect. Um, so I'm going to take questions, but before I do that, I need to make the IRS happy. I write books, you can buy them. So, this trip is now tax deductible. Questions? Oh God, it's Colin. Yes. <laughs> well, I think that uh, putting all the principles in a blockchain would be a really interesting patch to submit to the OpenSSH developers. I think they'd love to see that. No comment. <laughs> yes, sir. So the company I work for is actually doing exactly that. Okay. Putting everything in a giant blockchain. And Wait. The company you're working for is putting all the principles in a giant blockchain? Kind of. <laughs> okay. You need to submit a paper next year to BSD CAN. <laughs> One, why they did that, and two, what happened to the company? <laughs> um, come on, that, are you all stunned? Yes, sir. Will your next book be about key management and have the word violated in the title? <laughs> ah, no, I'm not writing a book on key management or violation. <laughs> Consent is a thing. Yes, Will. It is. And a lot it's, of hand-built stuff. Yep. And I guess I'm sort of curious, at what point does this complexity bring you close to server weight? At what point does the complexity of certificates bring you close to Kerberos? Oh, well, it, I, I'm going to fall back here on tools, not policy. Um, the nice thing about certificates is the network can be down and in many cases they'll still work. If you've distributed authorized principles, your Kerberos controller could be a smoking crater and you could still log in. Uh, tools not policy, choose your disaster mode, choose your headache. Uh, organizations like Facebook found this was the least appalling way to run their systems. I, I suspect that someone is going to build a web-based system for maintaining and submitting authorized keys and CAs and whatnot, uh, especially after this talk hits YouTube. Uh, But really, if, if you need 
certificates. You have a bunch of machines. You have teams for this. Uh, let them do their thing. Hire Darcy. He can do it without any errors. <laughs> Wait, wait, a comment and a question? You, mi you, you misunderstand the nature of the question session. There will be a question, and then an answer will be provided. So, here it, no, no, that is the rule. So here is my question to you. <laughs> what is your comment? Uh, Peter, please start. Please start breathing again. <laughs> uh, just a comment. Uh, my employer is moving from Kerberos to Precise with this system, and yes, it does work at very large scales, much better than the Kerberos method. Okay. Nice. The the comment is that Peter's employer is moving from Kerberos to certificates because it really does work better. Uh, which I'm reading as I should not write Kerberos mastery. What a vast relief. <laughs> Is there anyone else who has a question or, if they dare, a comment? <laughs> yes, sir. With the PKI, is there a good way to distribute a remote certificates list? Revoked. Revoked. Um, yes, the, the revoked cert marker. Uh, just mark the cert as revoked and push it out. The, the end goal of all of this is that when your user sees a warning, it means something. Something other than just type yes. Any other questions? Come on. We, we, oh, Colin again. OK. Uh, so I, I heard a rumor a few years ago that a large company that was mentioned earlier in your talk uh, with over a million servers decided that to SSA host keys were kind of a nuisance. And it would be a lot easier if they just deployed the same host key on every host. I'm, I'm just wondering if anybody here so the, the, the question is, uh, which Colin carefully phrased as a question for some weird reason. Um, he, he heard a rumor that some large organization that came up earlier in this talk deployed the same host key across all hosts. Does anyone know any truth? Can anyone confirm or deny? Um, I can say it's a terrible idea, but nobody can confirm or deny. OK, my, my faith in humanity is not complete. Oh, we have a hand in the corner. Oh, God, no. Please don't tell me. No, no, it, there is a use case. There is a use case for this. If you're running a cluster of firewalls and you're running CARP, you're always hitting SSH via that CARP. And carp. you're running what? CARP. CARP. Ah, oh. for something like a cluster. Um, and you're always SSHing, and you want both hosts to have the same key. I, I can understand why people would be tempted in a cluster. What I generally do is have a separate management IP for each of the firewalls so that I can uniquely identify the firewall. Uh, That's a hard saying cluster. Yeah, does it. yeah I, I would not use the same host key on each and uh, I want to SSH to a particular machine in the cluster, not just some random host in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I would certainly not do that. I can, I can understand that there are times when you may not have a choice because of some administrative concern, uh, but that, you know, problems with your management are beyond the scope of this talk. Yes, Philip. Um, there are um, environments where you cannot control the SSH config of the client, so uh, you might um, 
want to fill the uh, authorized keys on the server to add something like the third authority list and so on. Why didn't you add that to the talk? Um, why, didn't I, why did I not add things when you cannot control the client? Because the variety of ways in which you can be brutalized by terrible environments would fill a book far larger than my entire collection of things I've written. But you can control why the authorized uh, keys. You can add uh, a certain third authority list, or you, I'm never allowed to do port forwarding and all that, and you can add that on the host. So you can control it a bit. So oh. Oh, yes, you, you can control features and such and through the, the cert authority list. And I, I didn't add them to the talk because I wanted to get the talk in at between 45 and 50 minutes and leave some time for questions. But that's in the book. I, I believe that my marketing has the demands that I say I have, you know, the book around and you, you can get it. Um, if, if you want to know all this cool stuff that there wasn't time to talk about. Yes, sir. Sorry, I'm going to challenge you a bit on that uh, stuff. So okay. So that's not a question. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a warning. That, that's like a preface to a question. There is a scenario where, where you're using OSPF on a cluster, and all you're using all your users are SSHing to that cluster. Yeah, okay. That for AuthPF to the cluster, um, I would certainly say that yes, you could use the same key across multiple SSHs. However, I would also say that for the management of the host, it should go to a, a unique per host IP and have the, the cluster SSH service be only for AuthPF. And Patrick is waving his hand around. Does that? Oh, yeah. Um, and people are starting to walk in the door, which I believe is how nature tells presenters to get out. Thank you all for coming.